Bonjour à tous. Donc, euh, nous allons avoir le plaisir d'enchaîner deux conférences qui seront entièrement en anglais. Et donc aujourd'hui, nous avons le plaisir d'accueillir Cindy Crum, qui va vous parler donc euh, de, euh, du futur du SEO et à quoi s'attendre. Merci. Hello everybody, how are you doing? Yay! That's great. That's the best response I've ever gotten. Okay. Um, my name is Cindy Crum. I'm the CEO of Mobile Moxie. Uh, we specialize in mobile SEO uh, and ASO, which is SEO for apps. I've been doing SEO for a very, very long time. Um, and I'm so excited today to be talking to you about what you need to know about the future of SEO. Um, if you aren't familiar with my work, I have been doing this a long time. I started doing SEO in 2003. I started focusing on mobile SEO in 2005, which is before the iPhone even existed. I was talking about mobile SEO for Blackberries and things like that. Um, and so I've written a book, and last year was named one of the top 10 most influential SEO experts of 2022. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. And, and I've gotten to work for a lot of uh, the biggest companies in the world. Uh, so I'm, I have a lot of uh, different kinds of experience. So when we think about the future of SEO, um, I usually like to think about things first from Google's perspective. So from Google's perspective, they're facing a lot of new and unique challenges. They have market share threats um, from the new AI chatbots, ChatGPT, but also things like Amazon and Netflix have been taking some of their market share for a while. Uh, they also have this massive growing risk of bad content coming out of other AI systems and potentially getting into the index and influencing results in a bad way, making results wrong or low quality. And they're facing declining profits and declining clicks. Um, and so they make money on clicks, hence the name pay per click on the advertising system. So when people aren't clicking, Google's not making as much money, or potentially they're not. Um, and it's so bad for Google that they had to do layoffs uh, recently. They announced 12,000 layoffs, I think, towards the beginning of the year. Um, and so that's how bad it is. It's, it's bad for everyone, but it's bad for Google right now. Now, from our perspective as SEOs, it's also tough. Um, we're dealing with constant algorithm updates, and they seem to be coming fast and furious all the time, new updates, where it used to be a few updates a year, now it's many, and sometimes multiple updates just in one month. Um, we're dealing with also decreasing clicks, so our bosses want to know, where did the clicks go? Um, and we also are threatened by artificial intelligence causing potential layoffs or making our jobs less important. Um, and, and even if they don't make our jobs actually less important, our bosses might think they do. Um, and so uh, that's tough. And then we have Google constantly testing new search result features, new things that they add into the search results, not just AI, but you know the growth of people also ask and found on the web and all of the different things that are coming into the search result that keep people in the search result rather than sending people to a page. So if you don't know, Google just had their big annual conference called Google I.O. And then the next week after that, they had their uh, GML 2023, which is their advertising conference. And a lot of the announcements at these two events focused on artificial intelligence and a lot of um, new things that Google's trying to do. So when we think about the future of SEO, it's not just AI, but it, there's a lot of influence coming from what Google's trying to do to protect their market share and profitability with artificial intelligence. So to understand that, you have to know the background of what is artificial intelligence. And it starts with kind of deep learning, and then that's taking in a lot of data and trying to classify and understand it. Then machine learning, which builds on that. And then there's artificial intelligence. So there's layers of skills, digital skills, that Google is getting better at, but so are other companies as well. But with artificial intelligence, it's like the, the computers and the algorithms are not just finding information that already 
exists in their database, they're synthesizing information, and they're almost thinking a bit like a human. That's what Google's trying to do. And so if you, probably you're aware of this, but if you haven't started playing with it, there's a lot of stuff you can already um, take a look at in Google Search Labs, and they've put out not only the, the tools to check out the artificial intelligence um, that they're calling SGE, Search Generative Experience, uh, but they've also added in um, tools that can check your code with code tips, so AI code testing tool, and then the ability to add information from the SGE to Google Sheets. So go into Search Labs, turn these things on if you want to play with it and check it out and see to get a sense for what the future is going to be like. Um, but you'll see like some of them have simple answers like this. This is not a super sophisticated SGE response, um, but it's trying to highlight and answer the question, who is Cindy Crum? It highlights that she's the founder and CEO of Mobile Moxie, right? That's not a big one. Um, but when you look at some of these other cool things, you see this is the add to Google Sheets, and they're adding that search result to a spreadsheet, which is interesting because it, it gives you insight into how they think about their search results, not just as a place to find destinations, but as a destination itself. If you can add it to a spreadsheet, do you need to add a specific page when Google has the best pages all listed together on this destination? That's a different, that's a shift from how Google used to conceive of themselves. <laughs> Um, and then the code thing, the code is interesting because of course Google is made up of developers, but a lot of what they do with their communication is try and make the web better. Um, and that makes their crawling and indexing easier and better. And so the code checking I think is to help us, but also to help them. When the, there's better code on the web, then Google's job is easier. Um, and you can check out things like Google Bard, which is the chatbot that's part of the generative AI, and you can ask it a series of questions and try and get better synthesized answers that are not lifted specifically from one page, but that are a, con a collaboration of all of the information that Google knows on that topic, sort of. It's good, but it's not perfect. You can see in here, I start by asking, who is Cindy Crum? And its answer is, I don't know enough information about that person to help you with that request, da, 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 goes on. But then when you ask, who is Mobile Moxie, my company, it says Mobile Moxie is a mobile marketing company um, founded in 2008 by Cindy Crum. So it knows a lot of things, but it doesn't always put two and two together. Um, and that's what they're trying to get to. The goal will be to have that be a bit more seamless, and some of the other AI systems are, are doing better at that kind of thing right now. Uh, but you can test and play around with it because that's going to be integrated in with the chat functionality is going to be integrated in with these new SGE, Search Generative Experience, uh, results that come in position one, although they might not count as position one in Search Console, they push position one down, and they're really um, nice looking, interactive, and they're synthesized answers to questions rather than um, just a list of results for a query or a keyword. And they're often very interactive. They usually have chat at the bottom, pictures and things at the top, but it depends on the query, what, what's going to show up in those. But what you have to understand, if you look at um, how it's doing this and the background of how these AI systems work, they're built on language models, something that we sometimes call LLM, large language model. Um, and what it means is for Google to be able to synthesize information, they have to understand information. And to do that, they use these different language models to take in content in all different human languages and kind of turn it into a computer language that it can understand. So the first uh, language model that we really heard a lot about from Google was BERT, uh, which stands for Bidirectional Encoder Representation Transformers. That's a, a lot of like nonsense kind of words. Maybe it, it does mean something, but it was basically saying that 
Words can modify each other differently based on their order. This can modify this and mean one thing, or this can modify that and mean another thing. So for instance, if you were searching for a red stoplight, you would get pictures of a stoplight on the street. If you were searching for stoplight red, you might get nail polish and lipstick. Um, so one is modifying the other. They're transforming the meaning. Now, the next one is mum. Now, Google talked about mum being a thousand times more capable than BERT. MUM stands for Multitask Unified Model. Again, the words don't tell us a whole lot. What it tells us is kind of there are multiple tasks, either um, taking two different kinds of query results or two different kinds of information and synthesizing that into a more meaningful concept of a search journey. So when Google first started writing about this, um, they talked about MUM as a milestone for AI understanding of information, and they used this graphic, which I think is quite telling, because it gives you pictures, videos, maps, cards of facts, um, and it shows you all of these things in different languages. And so I think what's, what's important about MUM is it's taking in the concept of a journey and kind of making it a bit of a model for what is the most likely next step in a query. So Google wants to not only understand and respond to your current query, your current search, but to anticipate your next search and give you buttons and filters to try and help you along that so you don't even have to type. So the example that they give is um, about Mount Fuji. They're saying we understand that Mount Fuji is a place where you might want to go hiking. So what would you want to know about that? Well, you might need to buy new hiking boots. You might need to know the weather. You might want to book a flight. Uh, you might want a trail map. And so it's not just pulling up websites, but it's pulling up a collaboration of images, videos, e-commerce results um, to try and help you with this particular journey and they're trying to classify these journeys. So maybe I'm searching for Mount Fuji because I want to go on a hike, but someone else is searching for Mount Fuji because they're doing a book report. Those are different journeys, and so Google's trying to anticipate and understand what is your particular journey and classify you. And if you look in Chrome, near your History tab, you can go and see, it gives you the list of the sites that you've gone to, but now there's a new tab called Journeys, and it collects your searches into groups based on a topic or an understanding of what it's guessing you're interested in and what journey it's guessing you're on. And what I can tell you is I've watched this tab closely, and it used to be better. They've actually deprecated it a little bit and made it less good in terms of what it's telling you about your journey. Um, and I think this is because it was a bit creepy. It was scaring people um, that Google knew too much about the journeys they were on, right? Because that could be creepy. Um, but so as an SEO, when you're planning for your future projects, I want you to think about the journeys that your customers might be on and start thinking about that in your content planning to make sure that you're using the right keywords and linking to the right content that's part of one journey or maybe another journey. But it's usually not just one journey um, per product, right? There might be multiple reasons someone is searching for a new pair of shoes, right? Uh, or searching for Mount Fuji. So think about and try and push yourself to think about those journeys in different ways. Now, Google says that MUM has been deployed in dozens of features across search to improve the quality and help us understand and organize information in new ways. For example, we applied MUM to help people find related topics in videos, even when the topics aren't explicitly mentioned. That's a big deal because they're trying to relate one keyword to another piece of content, even if the keyword that, that relates them is not present on the page or on the piece of content. They're really trying to get a holistic understanding of what's going on. And that gets us back to the concept that's been around since mobile first indexing launched, which is what I call entity first indexing. Since, since Google switched to mobile first indexing, 
things have been more and more organized around the concept of an entity. Um, and so what is an entity? Well, an entity is a concept, and it happens before keywords. Um, entities are related to other entities in the same way in any language. So for instance, if I say mother, mother is related to father and daughter and son and grandfather in the same ways, regardless of what language I say mother in. Does that make sense? Am I going too fast? OK. Now, what happens when you have really good entity understanding by Google is they get to learn a lot faster. And they get to apply what they know in languages where they're strong uh, to languages where they're less strong. So we're, they're hoping to get better international results by applying the entity linkages that they know really well in big languages and, and apply those out to smaller languages and assume that the relationships between the word mother and the concept of mother are the same in all of these languages, but going much deeper into more complicated concepts than mother and father. So what happens when Google applies mum to an entity and they apply their learning and understanding is you get sometimes these new looking knowledge graphs uh, where you get a really interactive visual result, but also you're getting new filters that they're adding. So with Grumpy Cat, um, it has the, the normal filters that it would have in a knowledge graph, overview, videos, books. Uh, but at the top, notice how they've snuck in more filters up there that are not always there, right? The first three, images, videos, shopping, news, we're used to those. But then breed, meme, meaning, name, and movie are new filters that are specific to this topic and this query. They're trying to anticipate the journey and give you the filters to your next step, OK? Um, the other thing that's interesting about these kinds of results is if you're on a really slow connection, you can see the normal filters load first, and then the additional new filters take a little bit longer to load, because Google has to think about those, uh, but they don't have to think about the normal ones as much. So in this example, we're searching for football, um, and what happens is, in the US, football is understood as related to, or, or quite related to, the NFL, right? In, it used to be that this result, when you searched for football, would show you a knowledge graph about the game football. And of course, in this one, it's uh, soccer, right? You, what you guys would call soccer. Um, but, so in the US, they're saying football, They've changed it. They're not giving you the rules of the game or the shape of the ball or the look of the ball. They're saying most people who search for football, they really just want NFL. They really want the professional league. They don't want to know about the game. And that's interesting because it's a shortcut. Football and NFL are not the same thing, right? They're not. Google's jumping and skipping a step to try and anticipate what the searcher wants. And if they don't, if they get it wrong, they have these filters uh, to try and help you get to the right place. Now, what's interesting about journeys is it does seem that in many cases, the journey doesn't necessarily lead to a website. Google's trying to get smarter about the filters that it includes so that it can execute more searches and potentially show more PPC ads. But they're also trying to keep you in the search result longer by adding things like tracking your flight status when you search for United Airlines directly in the search result. Um, and it gives you a search function where you can put in your flight number and track that flight. And you never actually get to the United Airlines website. You just do it all from their knowledge graph. So we're thinking, when we think about the future, we're looking at what are the things that Google might want to lift from our website and put directly in the knowledge graph and looking around to see what's being lifted into the knowledge graph or into the search result or into the AI result um, for other companies in similar industries, not direct competitors necessarily, but look a little bit broader than that and say, what's Google trying to do for them? And would they ever try and do that for me? And if they did, what would I have to do to be ready for that. So when we look back at, at how MUM has already impacted our search results, it's led to a much wider range of in-SERP 
query refinements. So SERP just stands for a search engine results page. Um, and in the, the search results page, we now have all of these things, like people also ask and people also search for, that take up a lot of space and that are interactive but don't require a new page load. And what happens is people tend to like the idea of interactivity and not waiting for a page to load because it feels like less of a commitment. Um, and so they click on these more than they click on regular blue links. And so already many, many companies are seeing a decreasing number of search uh, clicks from search results um, because these interactive features take the traffic away. Um, in this one, you can see a couple different things going on. We have the people also search for, but then right under it, there's a whole other list of people also search for, and that's coming in not at the very bottom. You can see at the very bottom, there's more videos. It's interjecting because we, now we have infinite scroll. So they just start injecting all of their utilities to get you to either execute another search, which most of these things will do, or find your answer within this search result rather than clicking over to a page. Um, and these things are just all over and Google keeps testing new kinds of them and new, new labels for them, related searches. People also search for broaden your search, narrow your search, all of these different filters to understand your journey and to help save you time and clicks. Um, another thing that's happening that Google is doing is adding search functionalities directly from a website into a search result. So this is another airline one, and it's American Airlines. And when you search for American Airlines in the US, directly in the top of the search result, they're showing you the big phone number, but also a link to chat with that company that opens up a chat window directly in the search results. So again, you might rank there and be there and get interactivity, but it might never show up in your analytics, it might never show up in your search console because they never get off of the search results page. Now, Google also is trying to be smarter about images and image search and image understanding. Um, and there are a lot of um, great videos from Crystal Carter, um, who's the, an SEO at Wix, about visual search, which is different from image search. Visual search is when you're submitting an image um, as a query. And if you don't know, um, you can already get traffic from Google Lens when people do that. So you can see this is a website I work on, and Google Lens is sending referral traffic because we're showing up in the image results, or the, the sorry, the visual search results, um, but when people submit images. A and that's important um, in the same way that things like YouTube are important because they all send traffic and they all send rankings, um, but in this case, uh, this very sad day um, is what happens when Google really tries to hold on to traffic. Uh, so Google one day just decided and announced that they were going to stop showing video thumbnails in the search results uh, unless you're from basically YouTube. Um, and so they'll still show thumbnails from YouTube, uh, but for the rest of the sites that had video thumbnails, they went away. And this is what happened to traffic. So Google, this is a subtle thing, I think, but um, this is probably a way for Google to do better at meeting the demands of their bottom, bottom line. They're trying to make money, and they know that they make money when they send traffic from a search result to YouTube because they've monetized YouTube, of course, with ads everywhere. Um, but when they go to a site that has a video that's your site, that's, they're, they're not monetizing there. So, so they're doing these subtle things to try and protect their bottom line. And you need to watch out for that because when they're protecting their bottom line, it usually takes away from your clicks. It's usually either keeping people in a search result or keeping people in a Google property. Now you also have to understand that Google cares very much about voice search, even though SEOs make fun of it all the time, I don't care. Google cares about vi uh, voice search a lot to the point where at Google I.O. when they announced their newest Chrome pad, um, Chrome tablet, um, it, the new Chrome tablets come with a docking station and when you set your phone down or you set your tablet down to charge in the dock, it turns it into a Google Home Hub which is a voice activated assistant. Right? They, and they're trying, I think, with this to normalize the use of voice and the use of, of assistance um, and voice interactions. And if you think about it, 
when they're doing the chat functionality in the SGE results, that feeds directly into a voice query and a, and a conversation kind of model where you're talking to an assistant and going back and forth rather than just having one list of search results. Um, and so that's something to expect too. So looking at, at Google Home Hubs, trying Google Assistant to know what's there and what's not and how it's different is something you should definitely be investing in. Um, now the other thing that Google announced, at, at about the same time that they started talking about Google um, Mum was Google multi-search. And most people haven't heard about this, but it fits nicely with the rest of what they're doing. Um, it sounds like Mum, but multi-search is a little bit different because what it does is it goes beyond just text-based queries. And it lets you submit text with an image to get um, a different kind of query. So the example that they give is they submit this picture of the woman in the orange dress, and that's part of the query. It's an image of the woman in the orange dress, and they add the text that says, but in green. So you can see on the right side of the screen, it's a dress that looks like the orange dress, but in green. Now, if Google wasn't able to evaluate the picture of the orange dress, we have to know that in green is not going to surface the right results, right? It needs to combine the image with the text to really understand and get the question right. This is super important. It's great for fashion. I like that application, but super important when you don't actually know what to search for. So in this example, they take a picture of a piece of a bike and they say, how to fix? Because we don't know what this thing is called. Um, and that will give you, you know, the right answers to fix that part of your bike, even if you don't know what it's called. That's cool from a user perspective, but from an SEO perspective, it might be terrifying because what's the keyword there? Right? So we really have to update our model of how we're thinking about surfacing in results. We have to have images of the things that we're trying to rank for so that Google can use its brain to say, I know a website that has an image that looks just like that part, whatever it's called, and let's surface that website with that result or that video because I've matched up this image with that one, or I've understood this image with that one. Now, the other thing that's happening is Google's results tend to be getting more time aware or time sensitive. So this is um, a search result in the UK uh, for, uh, I'm very interested in football. So it's again for the query football, but this time the UK. Now in the UK, the number one ranking result almost all of the time for the query football is BBC Sport. Sometimes there's a news box above it, sometimes not. Um, and so if you're the SEO at BBC, you're pretty happy with that, ranking number one for football. Um, and if you're doing projections, your boss wants to know how much SEO traffic to expect on top keywords or related to football, you're doing projections, then you would assume that that would always be the case or that it would at least continue until something else changes. Well, what happened um, for, for a website that I work with is the four days before the World Cup last year, Google re-understood the word football to mean FIFA World Cup, to say that these things are the same. They're not, right? We already talked about that, but with football, soccer, American football. Um, so they're not, but for the duration of the World Cup, and I think a couple days after, they had this very long, like two mile long knowledge graph for FIFA. And so BBC wasn't getting that traffic, uh, nor were other companies that ranked in that result. It looked uh, like that, right? They were still ranking, hence the orange line, they're still ranking number one. But the traffic's gone. So tracking things like that and knowing what happened last year during this event or that event that's related to your industry is going to be important if anyone expects you to have accurate predictions about your traffic. Um, so in the, in the SGE results, we're seeing a mix of a lot of different things um, written 
AI-generated responses, um, source, sometimes sourced, sometimes not, but also ads mixed in, but they seem more authoritative when they're in that. Um, customer reviews, uh, and then filter refinements at the bottom. Sometimes it's chat at the bottom, and then people can vote whether or not it was a good result. So Google's still trying to learn and understand. Uh, but you have to know that that's happening in SEO, and it's also happening in paid. And that's going to be interesting as well, uh, because paid can be part of a journey. Anything can be part of a journey, anything that Google can see. So YouTube, paid, organic. And so in paid results, when these show up, they're going to be more interesting and more compelling as well. This is um, an example of a paid result where we have, again, AI-generated responses, um, carousels with offers uh, that are sponsored, chat for, for uh, follow-up questions. Um, and so when that comes into a result, even if there's not an organic SG kind of result, there might be a paid one. So uh, this is great, potentially, um, if you're in paid or if you're in e-commerce, because I think these kind of AI functionalities are going to help a lot with shopping and finding the right product, where you get a, a quick sense of what are the price options, what are the star ratings of the sellers, uh, things like that. Um, and, and Google has actually worked to, to make um, what used to be Merchant Center much better, and they've announced that in 2024 they're coming out with Merchant Center Next, which is how you used to do Google Shopping, now there's Organic Merchant Center, um, and it used to be done from a feed. Well, Google says that in 2024 you won't have to do a Merchant Center feed anymore, and in fact they're adding the ability for you to edit your product images, and AI generate descriptions with them, um, potentially. Uh, lots of things that they're promising advertisers to make it easier for e-commerce to advertise and for Google to ingest that information and potentially use it in their AI. But this is already happening a lot with regular Merchant Center. Um, with both free and paid results. And if you're not looking actively, um, you really should because Google's testing all different kinds of results. Sometimes uh, product results come in these visual four packs or sometimes that six pack on the right. And the problem is these kinds of things aren't well reported in Search Console or Google Analytics because how would you say what number ranking the red lawnmower on the lower left is 1.2.1. Like, how do we describe this in a ranking, in a numeric ranking? It's really tough. Um, so you might need to be start thinking about getting visual representations of search results, and, and they might be different from location to location, from one device to another. Um, and the, the odd thing is, what we're not used to, usually a search result will have maybe one people also ask, but that's not true when it's an e-commerce result. See, this is from the Mobile Moxie tools. We track all of these things, and you can see we have a shopping grid that happens in actual rank 7, actual rank 10, and actual rank 14. Um, it's happening multiple times throughout the search, mixed in with blue links and people also ask and whatever else. Um, and, and so it was so bad that we, instead of just counting traditional SEO rankings, um, the knowledge graph and paid and people also ask, they're taking up so much space that we started showing you the traditional ranking like Search Console would count it, but also the actual ranking and counting everything because I think that's becoming more and more important. Um, so we have both and pixels from the top because even when you rank number one, like in the FIFA example, it's useful to know where is number one. Is number one you know, at 500 pixels or is it at 3,000 pixels? Um, because that can change. And if you're only looking at something that counts r ranking position one, like a SEM rush, you're always going to, it's, it'll be a straight line. Position one, you'll think you're fine. Um, so, 
understanding and watching what's happening in Merchant Center seems very important because these kinds of results, what we know from paid, when Google started launching the product listing ads, the shopping carousel, those got way more clicks than regular paid ads, than text ones. And so we know that in organic, when these things come in from Merchant Center, they're going to get way more clicks than the blue links. So you need to make sure that you, if you have a competitive product, it's ranking in these results um, via Merchant Center or in 2024, Merchant Center Next, um, so that you can be there. And you know, potentially leveraging some of the cool new stuff from Google will help. Um, but be, be aware of what's happening. The other thing that happens a lot from Merchant Center is sometimes when you click through, you don't go directly to a website, but you stop at what we're calling product knowledge graphs. So this is a, a Roomba, but it's a lawnmower. Do, do you guys, have you seen these? I, I don't own one yet. Um, but anyway, it'll just rove around your lawn. Um, and when you click from the main result, on that one, instead of going to a seller, it goes to the product knowledge graph where it shows you the list of sellers and competitive prices. So that, again, is going to take a click. And it's another way for you to rank there, but then have that, that traffic taken away if someone else in your knowledge graph has a better price or faster shipping or whatever. Um, so that's the problem, is that all this fun interactivity and information is decre decreasing clicks. So even when ranking goes up, your traffic can be going down. And this is a common thing that I'm seeing. Um, so, so that's all great, but is understanding a ranking factor? What do you think? Is understanding a ranking factor? Mom is about understanding. Language models about understanding. Does it matter for ranking? It matters, but it's not a ranking factor. It's kind of a secondary ranking factor. Um, so then why should we care? Well, the way I think about this, it's a ranking factor and it's kind of a gatekeeper. So you have to have great EEAT, which Lily's going to talk about. And if you don't, you might not even be evaluated for understanding. So if you have great EAT, then the language understanding models are going to try and understand your content. And uh, if you have great, understandable, meaningful, unique content, then that's what it's going to take to get into the AI results. I think that these are gatekeepers. And I, I'm, I think about it a lot. Is it EEAT first or understanding first? And I'm not sure, but what I do believe is that you need both to be put into an AI result or for Google to understand and appreciate the, the authority and the content on your site. So um, what you need to do um, to optimize for mom and to optimize for the AI is know what's happening in mobile and desktop search results, where you are, and in other countries. Um, focus on useful content that is unique, not a repetition of what everyone else has. You have to bring something to the party that's, not, that's unique. It's not just a repeat of everyone else's stuff. Um, <laughs> And if you can't, if you're really struggling, I've been suggesting companies shift their SEO focus from regular Google to ranking in YouTube because I think that's, that might be easier for some companies if you have great videos already, then optimizing in YouTube will get you a shortcut to getting into uh, the search results. And, and other places that Google likes to rank, they like to rank YouTube, they like to rank Twitter. If you can't get into the results on your website, find places where where you can get into the results by proxy um, that Google wants to rank um, and leverage those kinds of social media things uh, to, to do that because Google tends to rank those really well. Um, and then don't forget to test your, your results in other countries and other languages, especially if you're in a multi-language uh, country, uh, because the results can change quite a bit. So this is an example of an English query, but the phone language is set to Hindi. Um, and it's from Fiji. And what you see is we have a mix of Hindi and English uh, because we're sending conflicting signals. Um, and, uh, and you can test that. Mobile Moxie has tools that are free that let you test it. So, so that's it. That's my talk. Uh, and I appreciate it. And I've, yay, thank you. Now.
I'm supposed to ask you a question, so, and someone's going to get a mug. So the question is, who remembers what MUM stands for? Raise your hand, or we can't. We only have one mug to give away. Uh, it stands for multitask unified model. Yay! Great. Thank you.